aid kit there at the building just in case. It has been a privilege to be here. I've got to meet many of you that I have read after, that I've studied after, and uh, want to love you through your writings, and it's certainly a privilege to meet you. I do want to express my appreciation to Michael and to Paul for inviting me to come, and uh, I guess they didn't know what they was getting into when they <laughs> invited me, but uh, Michael, I really didn't realize that I'd gone over time. I thought I'd done real good. <laughs> And uh, I don't hear things, <laughs> but it is a privilege to be here, and I'm honored to be here. And Michael said to keep it short, and I'll do my best to do that. My topic is the all-sufficiency of the church. I believe that we live in a strange age. We live at an age where things are, as Dub wrote in an article, topsy-turvy. An age where things are not as they were whenever I was a young person. Oh, there's always been sin. There's always those who hated Christianity. That's been around for a long time. But there's now attacks upon Christianity. It's not, it doesn't bother a school to have activities uh, on Wednesday nights. Whenever I was a young person, that was unheard of. Uh, the things that the news media portrays us as, and the, just the, even the entertainment media, the way that they portray us as being bigoted, uh, harsh, and hateful, and self-righteous, is certainly not an accurate picture, but it is designed to take people more into hedonism and to humanism than it is to point them in a way which will make this nation great. I truly believe that the home is all sufficient when it follows God's rules. I believe the government is all sufficient whenever it follows the principles laid down in the word of God and by God, and this government used to know that. I believe the church also is all sufficient for everything that God has appointed it to do because it was planned by God, Ephesians 3, verses 10 through 11, because it was built by Jesus Christ himself, Matthew 16, 18 and 19, because it accomplishes all that God desires it to accomplish. When men are not happy with the Lord's church, as it is revealed in the New Testament, these same men of necessity believe that they know more than our God in heaven. Jeremiah 10, verse 23. Lord's church, and I want to go through some of these areas. First of all, I want to talk about the work of the church, and then we'll talk about some ways men have changed it. The Lord's church is all sufficient for the work of evangelism. The church does not need to form separate organizations to do the work of evangelism, such as the missionary society. This is saying God's church is not sufficient to accomplish what God set it down here upon earth to do. 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, If I tarry long, that thou mightest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the, church, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. So Paul made it very clear, very clear, that it is the church that's the pillar and the ground of the truth. It is the supporting structure of the truth, and it is also to take that truth out into all the world. In Acts the 11th chapter, we we'll go back to the time of the persecution of Paul. And I believe it skips a little bit here to the time after Peter's preaching to the gospel. I believe that's the only, con I know some people disagree with that, but that's the only way I can see this context. I can't see him going to the Gentiles until after Peter opened the keys of the kingdom to the Gentiles in Acts the 10th chapter. Now with that in mind, 
I want to read from Acts 11, beginning in verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that rose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyrus and Antioch, preaching the word. But then it goes on to say, but none of, but to the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Greeks. I believe there's a large skip in time here. Where they begin preaching to the Gentiles. When was that? That would be after Peter, because he is the one who opened the doors of the kingdom to both the Jew and to the Gentile. And after all, why is it put after this event? Going back and look at it and then bring us to this point. Preaching the Lord Jesus. What did they do? These were members of the Lord's church. They were scattered abroad. And what did they do? They preached the word of God. They preached the gospel. Why? That man might be saved. Those who would hear it, believe it, and act upon its message. Many are the preachers that we read of in the book of Acts. Paul, Peter, Philip. Stephen and others who preached the gospel to the people there. Being sent out sometimes by various congregations. Paul, especially from the congregation at Antioch, was sent out to preach the gospel. But he didn't rely upon a separate organization. And the reason is, not because, not because he didn't want it or it just hadn't been thought of, but rather because that's the work of the church and you cannot build something else to do the work that the church is supposed to be doing. To do that is to say the church is not sufficient to its purpose. That God made something that man has to supplant, that man has to add to, that man has to build something else to do it. Kind of like Sarah and Hagar when Sarah decided to help God out by giving her handmaid to Abraham to bear children. It doesn't work out very well, does it? And it doesn't work out very well today either. In Philippians 1, verse 5, Paul did receive help. We read here where he writes to the Philippian congregation, he says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. They, what is he talking about? He's not just talking about the, 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 the binding that we have together as Christians. He's not just talking about the fact that we are one in Jesus Christ, that we are all children of God. He's talking about something else here. He's talking about the fact that they supported him financially in the work of evangelism. Who did it? The Philippian congregation. In Philippians 4, 15 through 16, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again to my necessity. What? Church at Macedonia, Thessalonica was one of them. I mean, the Philippian congregation was one, Thessalonica was another. And what did the Philippians do? They sent, they helped Paul preach the gospel by supporting him financially. Well, 2 Corinthians 11 is even a little bit more clear about church cooperation. Whatever it says in verses 8 and 9, I robbed other churches, plural. I, might, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them, that I might do you service. What did he do? He took funds from other congregations while he was preaching here at Corinth. Cooperation in the work of evangelism. And yet, who was doing it? It was totally and completely done among congregations. He goes on to say in verse 9, I'm willing to notice part of that, that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. About financial help here. Why didn't they build a missionary society? Because God didn't authorize it. God didn't want it. He said, they put the church here for the purpose of, of evangelism. That's its work. And we don't need to build some man-made organization to do what God built the church to do. 
Well, someone said, well, what about publishing houses? Aren't they doing the work of evangelism? Well, they do not themselves evangelize. They produce materials that the church purchases to use in evangelism. Completely different. Michael, you might buy certain material from a publishing house. Other congregations might buy from that same publishing house. But we're not all sending that publishing house money and then they decide where to send it, do we? doesn't work that way. We buy the materials and we distribute them as we see, the, see fit to do so. It's not a separate organization doing the work of the church in evangelism. They're supplying materials for us. Completely different thing. Well, what about congregations supporting the work of an evangelist through a sponsoring congregation? It's still the work of the church. And the church is supporting and performing that work. No new organization has been built to do the work of the church. And you have just as much autonomy in each congregation that sends money to that supporting congregation as though you had sent it to the work itself. You've decided to support that work. The funny ideas that people come up with about forbidding things that's perfectly reasonable, that's perfectly right, and certainly it's right and proper that we can use a good means and a proper means to support those in other areas. To say that we need to build another organization to do the work of the church is to deny the wisdom of God in establishing his church and setting forth evangelism is its work. By the way, I've got to add this, and that is the fact that whenever the church supports the work of evangelism, that evangelism is accomplished by preaching, not by drama, not by putting on skits, not by having carnivals and foolishness. It's accomplished through the gospel. I've been in congregations where they told me, we used to have a large number of young people attend here, and we had this program, and we had that program, we took them to Six Flags, and we did this with them, and we did that with them, spent all this money doing that. And where are they now? They're gone, gone. That's not what saves people. That's not what converts people. That's not even what holds people. The people need to be converted not to Six Flags, not to carnivals, not to entertainment, not to skits, and not to drama, but converted to Jesus Christ through the Word. The Lord's church is all sufficient for its work of benevolence. In 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4, concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in stores, God hath prospered. Now, why was that? Well, because there was a need in Jerusalem. They were support, going to gather up funds from various congregations and take it to Jerusalem because of the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Now, I want to notice some things. The early congregations were willing to help financially where there was a need. Sometimes cooperation among congregations occurred, and that's the case here in this, in this particular instance. Not only was the Corinthian congregation to give and to support, do this work, but also the churches of Galatia. We're going to see the church of Macedonia and Archaea also were to give into this common effort of benevolence. We read of such things as Acts 4, verse 34, benevolent work. Neither is there any among them that lack, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of these things that were sold. They met the apostles' feet, you'll remember. The congregation at Antioch in Acts 11, verse 29, then the disciples, every man, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren which dwelt in Judea. 
again what is it? The work of benevolence that they're doing. Many congregations cooperating. In Romans 15 verse 26, for it pleased them Macedonia and Archaea to make a certain contribution for the poor saints. Now the American Standard Version correctly has poor among the saints at Jerusalem. And so they were helping in these instances. Paul's testimony to the Corinthians concerning the churches of Macedonia are found in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, verse 4, where it says, Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Congregations should be willing to do this work if they possibly can, and they need to be willing to, to do it by giving of themselves first as the Macedonians had done. But again, in the work of benevolence, the church is all sufficient. There's no authority for building another organization to do the work of benevolence. The building of a disaster relief fund organization is nowhere found in the New Testament. It's parallel to the missionary society. Well, what about children's homes, you say? Well, the work of the church is distinct from the home. Homes can provide secular education. It's not the work of the church to provide secular education. The home can provide entertainment. And though many congregations have gone into the work of entertainment, it's not a work of the church. And you cannot find it being done by the New Testament church. And it's certainly not evangelism. I had a man once tell me, he's having a youth thing and he's showing a Disney show. I said, who's paying for the Disney movie? He said, well, it came out of the treasury. I said, is that evangelism, edification, or benevolence? He said, well, we view it as a part of our outreach program. <laughs> Can you imagine? What was he calling it, really? He said, this is evangelism, but he's using a different word, wasn't he? Can you imagine trying to evangelize with Mickey Mouse? That's ridiculous, isn't it? And yet that's what many congregations are doing. They're turning to foolishness like this and calling it evangelism. And it's not. Social activities. Let's keep people interested. Now, I like to socialize with my brethren. If I was going to play basketball, who better than my own brethren to play it with? Isn't that right? If I'm going to go bowling, who better to go bowling with than my brethren? Isn't that right? But that's not a work of the church. It's not today, and it never has been, and it never will be. These activities, social activities, are a work of the home. Congregations can supply homes that are in need with funds and supply entertainment, social activities, education, things of this nature that the church has no right to provide. And not only that, in some places they're not happy with the church having to do it, but they want the school to do it too, don't they? Neither should the church ask the community or go to non-Christians asking them to support the work of the church. The pattern is free will giving by members of the church. Now don't misunderstand, that doesn't mean that if we have a visitor and they choose to give, that we have to return what they give us and tell them it's unwanted. Some cases we might have to, but we certainly do not solicit funds from non-members. By the way, we'll go back just one notch. I want to tell you something. I went to a congregation where one of the men told me, and it's a good thing they talked to the men of the congregation, they wanted to have a party for the young people. Nothing wrong with having a party until you find out what kind of party it was. You know what kind of party they wanted to have? A swimming party. You think about how people dress at the swimming pool. Christians ought to know better. That time it was good that they came to the congregation and talked to the congregation about it first. The Lord's church is sufficient in edification. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 4 verses 11 through 16. I'm only going to notice a part of that because Michael will get mad if I read too much. For the edifying of the body of Christ. 
for the edifying of the body of Christ. What? The church is to do this. It's to edify the body. What is the body? Time after time after time. We've looked at Ephesians, the first chapter, the last two verses, Colossians 1 verse 18, and we've seen that the body is the church. And then at the last verse of that that. That passage, verse 16, it says, that it maketh increase of the body unto the edifying, the building up of itself in love. But how do you edify the body? Well, we'll have a lot of meals, and we'll go out, and we'll play miniature golf, and we'll do that, and that's, that's edification. No, it's not, brethren. Acts 20, verse 32, Paul writing, or speaking to the elders from Ephesus says, and now, by the way, says, quote, I got a good preacher. I copied that off of now, so it makes it all right. <laughs> to, to the word of his grace, which is able to, what is it? His word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. What's able to build us up? God's word. That's able to build us up. You know, all these fellowship meals can build me out, but they don't build me up spiritually. That's a fact of the matter. Well, let's go on. By the way, to build other organizations to do the work of benevolence is to say that the Lord's church is insufficient. The same thing applies to edification, some of the foolish ways that people are trying to accomplish edification and some of the foolish things they're doing as congregations to do that. Had one preacher, don't know if I told you this or not because I forget what I tell people, but had one preacher say that he went to a congregation to talk to them about the work. They was having a youth rally. And whenever he got there, a clown met him on the parking lot. <laughs> they, were, they were putting up quite a show. That kind of thing don't belong in the Lord's church. It's not a work of the church, and it shouldn't be. Lord's church is all sufficient in its worship. Jesus was clear. When he was speaking to the Samaritan woman in John 4, verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Two qualifications. Number one, in spirit, from your innermost being, in all sincerity, and in truth, according to God's word. John 17, verse 17. The worship of the church consists of five acts. They are the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 30. I've received of that of the Lord that which also delivered unto you. And then he told them about the Lord's Supper. So what he had received, he had delivered to them. He expected them to partake of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And the fact that it represented the Lord's body and it was a memorial. He told them all that. And he told them that they must... Partake in a worthy manner. And he told them to discern the Lord's body. By the way, that word discern means to distinguish, to separate one from another. And yet you go to congregations. And I wanted to talk about this later. I'll just wait till I get through with worship, so I'll get to it then. Giving. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. Now concerning the collection for the saints as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week. Let every one of you lay by in stores. God hath prospered him. That's the pattern. Let's look at the next point. Preaching and teaching. Acts 2, verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching or doctrine. That is preaching. You've got four acts of worship here. The apostles' doctrine, which is preaching, fellowship, which is giving, breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, and prayers. If these are not all acts of worship, then something's out of context here, because this is the context of worship. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 4, verse 2, Paul admonishes the young preacher Timothy to do what? Preach the word. Why? Because their ears, they shall turn their ears away from the truth and be turned into fables. Preach it when people want to hear it. Preach it when people don't want to hear it, in season, out of season. In Acts 20, verse 7, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight, Michael. <laughs> Pray. <laughs> I'm sorry, Michael. I, I don't mean any of that. <laughs> Pray. Acts 2, verse 42. 
They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, break your bread. And what else? And in prayers. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 14 through 16. I want to notice verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Now let's go back. I want to look at some of these things. We talked about saying Saying one to another, making melody where in your heart, Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, verse 16. It's sad, and I believe it's tragic, that people are often unhappy with the simplicity of the New Testament pattern of all things pertaining to the church. But particularly with the pattern of worship. People are not satisfied with the simplicity that's found in the word, New Testament worship in the Word of God. Every single act of worship has been corrupted in some way. There's not a one that has been left alone. The Lord's Supper. Now we have transubstantiation, partaking at times other than every first day of the week, such as at funerals, simultaneous worship, singing while you partake of the Lord's Supper. I've even known of a congregation. They got there that morning, found out that they were out of fruit of the vine. They had some orange Kool-Aid. Guess what we got that morning? <laughs> Talk about, drive down to the quick stop, buy some fruit of the vine. If you can't find it, postpone it till afternoon and then have the Lord's Supper. Don't pervert it by putting something on there that God never authorized. You know, there is something to be prepared. Now, Michael, you think I wasn't prepared on that PowerPoint. You're right, I wasn't. Sometimes technology goes bad. But I've seen two people with paper sermon outlines that they had trouble too. <laughs> okay, Ephesians 5, 19. I'm jumping back. Giving, Lord's Supper. What about our giving? Raffles, car washes, rubbish sales, gambling, bingo. Asking non-Christians for financial or material support. That's how giving has been corrupted. I've even heard of congregations having cakewalks. Can you imagine bingo? It's gambling. Don't they know gambling's a sin? How God has authorized us to make, make our, our money? Don't they know it's not only a sin for me as an individual, but especially for those people who claim to be Christians in a congregation of the Lord's people to go out and offer bingo games? Oh, what the Lord must think of people today. Also preaching or teaching. What, how they, have they corrupt? Well, they couldn't corrupt preaching and teaching, could they? Well, we got drama, don't we? Got to put on shows, skits, preaching everything but the Bible. Not preaching the whole counsel of God as Paul said he had done. And I know that. That uh, there's no witch doctor, probably within a two, three thousand miles of here. Maybe I ought to preach on witch doctors. Won't make anybody mad that way. Certainly don't want to preach on... Social drinking might make somebody mad. Got to have that check coming. Don't want to preach against dancing, against mixed swimming, things of that nature. Might lose that wage, might lose that support. Friend, we need people who preach the word in season, out of season. Why? Because they love lost souls. That's of necessity. Praying. Lights out to create a mood. I know. I've prayed in the dark. Haven't you ever prayed in the dark? But I didn't turn out the lights to create a mood. I turned out the lights because I was going to bed. Or else I prayed because the lights went out. We didn't have electricity. 
Or maybe we was in a tent or a camper or something. And so I prayed with that with the lights out. But you can, you can pray without the lights out. But it's wrong when we deliberately do it to create an artificial mood. What is it that's supposed to cut us to the heart? The outside things? Or is it the word of God that cuts us to the heart? Some of us think it's special effects such as candles to create that mood. And they're wrong. Lord never authorized such foolishness, and it don't hold people. Praying to Jesus in prayer instead of to the Father. Stephen spoke to Jesus in a vision. In the book of Revelation, they speak to Jesus in a vision. If that authorizes us to pray to Jesus, it also authorizes us to pray to angels because men have spoken to angels in a vision. If one authorizes prayer, so does the other. If not, why not? Well, you do not read of any instance of an actual prayer to Jesus Christ. Paul stated more than once, I Pray to the Father of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray to God, who is, and then mention Jesus Christ as a separate entity more than once. Jesus said, you'll no longer ask me, but you will ask my Father. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, he said. We pray to the Father through Jesus Christ, our intercessor and mediator. Singing. Well, certainly I can't think of anything on singing. Instrumental music. We love our instrumental music. I like instrumental music. I was raised during the 60s. And I enjoyed music. I enjoy music, everything from ragtime to classical now. All kinds of music I can listen to and thoroughly enjoy unless it's trash, and some of it's trash. Even in genres I like, you'll find some trash. So you have to be careful. But the thing is, I'm not talking about it's liking instrumental music in worship because I don't. It doesn't belong here. It's not of God. We already saw that God authorized singing, and he said, make the melody where? In your heart. Choirs, solos, praise train, sing one to another. It's reciprocal. We're to pray one to, we're to sing one to another. We're to edify one another in our songs. That's speaking of worship and, and the assembling of the saints. It's speaking of the fact that we build one another up by singing to one another. And so we have congregational singing. Praise teams. I have no idea where we came up with that. Give a few of our best singers microphones because we want the singing to sound good. Well, I believe each and every one of us ought to sing to the very best of our ability. I don't believe that we ought to be slack in our worship to God in singing or prayer or any aspect of the way we worship God. But let me tell you something. If the best you can do is a screech, then screech. Because we're to sing. And Dub will tell you right off the bat. I don't know if he's heard me sing, but if he has, he'll tell you. That my voice is one that'll scare the hogs away from the slop. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> so we need to sing anyway. And I don't believe in, in not singing because my voice isn't good. The Lord doesn't need our additions or our substitutions in worship. While some may well want to alter the Lord's plan to entice the worldly, God's worship is sufficient. And to deny this is to deny the wisdom of God. God's church is sufficient in all of these areas, in its worship, in its work. Jesus said, worship God in spirit and in truth. Any and all changes to the pattern revealed in the New Testament make worship empty and are no more acceptable than that of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus, the 10th chapter. 
Matthew 15, verse 9, but in vain empty do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. The Lord's church is sufficient in its government. To deny that is to deny the all-sufficiency of the church. The Lord's church is all-sufficient in that in it is the saved. Acts 2, 47. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The American Standard Version, those that were saved, New King James Version, those who are being saved. Ephesians 5, 23, the husband is the head of the wife and he is the savior of the body. It's sufficient to be the savior, uh, the savior of mankind because it is the body of Jesus Christ and only because it's the body of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 16, they might reconcile both unto God, speak of Jew and Gentile, in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, the enmity separating Jew and Gentile. That enmity is described as the Ten Commandments. The body is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. It is purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, Acts 20, verse 28. The fact is that Jesus is the Savior of the church. He is not the Savior of the Rotary Club, the Boy Scouts, the Lions Club, or any man-made religion. None of these are sufficient. Only the church of Christ, only the church that Jesus built and purchased with his blood is sufficient. No denomination can save a single soul. There's no doubt that the church that Jesus built is all sufficient to glorify God in its worship, in its work, in its organization, in the fact that outside the church there's no salvation. Let us love her, honor her, and be faithful to her. And that's the 16th chapter. Paul and Silas had been freed from prison by an earthquake. The jailer asked the question, what must I do, whenever he realized that all the prisoners were still there. What he was asking is, what must I do to be saved? They answered and told him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and all thy household and thou shalt be saved. A lot of people stop right there, but a little later on we read that they preached the word of God to him. And whenever they preached it to him, what did he do? He was baptized. There's five steps to salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. You're saved from all your past sins at that point because you contact that blood of Jesus Christ with which he purchased the church. And you're placed in the church by God himself. There's one other thing I want to mention. After you've been saved from your past sins, you must continue faithful unto death. We're to be, present our bodies what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. If you're subject to the imitation of Jesus Christ, won't you come while together we stand? Come to Jesus.